Now listen about our speaker, Dr. Jeremiah Johnston, a New Testament scholar, professor, apologist, and speaker. Johnston completed his doctoral residency in Oxford in partnership with Oxford Center for Mission Studies and received his PhD from Middlesex University, United Kingdom with commendation. Johnston serves as the founder and president of Christian Thinkers Society, a resident institute here at Houston Baptist University. And he is also associate professor of early Christianity. Now, let me tell you a little something. I, I call him Dr. Jeremiah, but uh, he was f from Kansas City. But he has heard from God because, Doc, come up, since you're over there, come to the side. He has become an Astros fan. Could you give him a hand, please? Come on up. Now, I believe he has his uh, beautiful bride with him, and he'll probably introduce her. Would you please give a warm welcome for Dr. Jeremiah Johnston? Hey, if you need this. Thank you so much, Celine. And you guys, I think we were so blessed to have Celine leading us. Can we give him a big round of applause and say thank you, Celine, so much? <sighs> you know what, you guys? I want to be real with you this morning. I, tr I speak different places and have the privilege to travel and share the good news and answer people's questions. But when I speak at HBU, I'm speaking at home. And I feel so at home this morning. And it's such an honor for me to be here. God is going to do something so special in the next 20 or so minutes. So I wanna ask you two things as I begin speaking, and we can go ahead and bring that slide up. Number one, I'm gonna ask that unless it's an absolute emergency, please don't be moving around the auditorium. Of course, those of you who are coming in now, come on in and have a seat. But unless it's an emergency, don't move, because I'm really praying and trusting God that because of what's said today and what you say back to me, I'm praying that it's gonna save someone's life. And I don't mean that just figuratively or metaphorically. I mean that physically saves someone's life. Secondly, I want to ask those of you that are my students, your Christians, your prayer warriors, would you just please pray the whole time I'm speaking up here? And would you pray for everybody around the auditorium? Because we're praying truly for God to break bondages today, uh, lies of Satan to stop being believed. So check out this slide. I'm going to introduce you to come with me to all of my events. This is what we do at Christian Thinkers Society. What's so awesome about this chapel this morning, it's a conversation. I'm not here to preach at anybody, and all God's people said, amen. I'm here to have a conversation, an interaction, because in many ways, what you text me in the next few minutes you're going to decide pretty much what I'm going to be talking about, the direction of my message. I'm, you can't talk about being any more relevant than that to this room today. I'm not here to talk about what I talked about in North Carolina or Los Angeles. I'm, I want to meet the needs of the group here. So everybody, this has probably never happened since, probably won't happen until next time, hopefully Salim has me, but take out your cell phones. I want you to be texting the entire time that I'm talking. Right on? I want you to be texting. The only thing I want to humbly ask you, would you please text me? And guess what? I'm going to be texting you back the entire time. So I want to apologize for that in advance. So go ahead and switch off your volume like I'm doing right now. My text number is a really easy number to remember. Everybody, can you remember five digits for me? 22333. Three, three. Say that out loud with me. 22, two, I can't, oh my gosh, weak. That's weakness. 22333, three, three, three. okay? 22333. Three, three, three. The only thing is... Now, I have like supersonic eagle vision, but I don't know if you can see that. I need you to start your first text with the number four and then HBU, no, no spaces. And we're going to check out what's really awesome about this. Now, none of you all be hating on me either, okay? Can I just ask your permission? Don't be hating on me while I'm speaking because I'm going to show you the live results, all right? It's always a little bit of a faith step for me. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think uh, I have anything embarrassing on. In fact, I wore this for our wonderful Strohs, so... And anybody who's streaming right now in Kansas City, where I'm from, and my wife is from, is going to be hating on me on social media. So I'm going to get enough of that as it goes. So thank you for those preliminary remarks. My question that I want to ask you, I've received 4,000 questions in all my events, and I'm going to tell you about a book before you leave. Uh, but I have a question for all y'all this morning. What is stressing you out right now? I want to hear about it. And don't give me the sanitized version. Don't give me the Christian ver version. Give me the legit version. I mean, what are you stressed about right now? I want to hear it. And guess what? You might need to text me like more than once. I, you can text me 100 times if you want. 
I've set the system for about seven or 800 responses. So I want you to text me, what are you stressed about? And we're going to see what the results are. I want to dedicate the rest of my remarks to the two students that visited me last semester in my office in Brown 227. And by the way, I'm not Dr. Johnston right now. I'm Jeremiah. I'm your brother. So we're going to have a family discussion for a minute. They came to my office, and when you come to my office and you shut the door, it's a first name conversation. I had two students at two different times. These students are rock stars. They're A students. I hope they both go on to do their PhDs. Undergrads, and they said, Jeremiah, would you pray for me? I've been thinking about taking my life. Has anyone ever said that to you? Have you ever had that kind of conversation with someone where they actually walk up to you and they say, I'm thinking about completing suicide. I'm going to teach you this morning how to respond when someone walks up to you or when you discern in your spirit and your heart that someone around you is in danger. Now, my hobby is going to the swimming pool, okay? I absolutely love living in Houston, by the way. <clears throat> I used to live in Canada. God bless me. Thank you so much. I'm not in Canada anymore. I'm in Houston. So <laughs> I get to be in warm weather. Not hating on any of my Canadian friends, but the weather was awful. So I love going to swimming pools, and the swimming pool where we live has a lifeguard. They have a lifeguard to save people's lives. I'm going to teach you this morning how you need to be the lifeguard in someone else's life when you leave here. Some of you, I want to speak to you also from my heart. You walked in here, and you are super stressed right now. Now, the person on your right, the person on your left, they may not know that. They might not understand the gravity, the reality of the stress in your life. And I want to give you some words of hope this morning. Have you noticed that we live in this culture of death? I mean, thanks to social media, a day doesn't go by where we do not see some kind of horrific act of death. We live in a culture of death. I'm going to teach you how to save a life. I mean, think about Robin Williams. Robin Williams recently completed suicide, very unfortunately. Do you know there's an interesting study that just came out? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to myself saying this. Do you know Robin Williams was an addictive gamer? Did you know that? He was like a humongous gamer. And all of these studies are beginning to filter out that if you were addicted to gaming, you have a higher propensity for chronic depression. This whole virtual world. Now, by the way, parenthetical note, text me. I will challenge anybody in here to a game of Madden online, okay? I mean, I've been playing it since before you all were born. So I think my name is Fight to Fight on PlayStation, but I have an Xbox too, so bring it on, okay? So commercial over. Jim Carrey's girlfriend last weekend completed suicide. Mick Jagger's girlfriend completed suicide. I'm reading this morning from probably my favorite New Testament translation, and I want you to take this verse down. It's 2 Timothy 1.7, 2 Timothy 1.7, and I'm going to pivot off of this Bible verse for the next 20 minutes, and we're going to discuss what this verse has to say about suicide and depression. The title of my message today is Our Invisible Disease. Notice I didn't say mine. I said all of our invisible disease. What every Houston Baptist University student has to know when you walk out of here about suicide, mental illness, and how to intervene. I'm going to give you something at the end of my talk called the key question. And if you don't hear anything else, I want you to hear the key question that you ask when you encounter somebody that's suffering and hurting. 2 Timothy 1.7 the Apostle Paul, and I'm not going to give you a Bible lesson more than just give a little bit of a setup. I do have a New Testament history. The Apostle Paul is writing from a dungeon in Rome. It's the mid-AD 60s. The murderous, psychotic Nero is on the throne, and he knows that his life is quickly ending. He says that in 2 Timothy 4. He's writing to his young son in the faith, Timothy, the man that he has mentored to take over his churches and to take his mantle. And guess what? Timothy is seeing the bruising, the suffering, the attacks that the Apostle Paul is going through, and he's saying, I don't know if I want to do this Christian ministry gig. I don't know if I'm cut out for that. And so look at verse 6, 2 Timothy 1, 6. He reminds him of his Christian heritage, the faith that was in Lois, your grandmother. Timothy, your mother Eunice was a Christian. You have this history of Christian faith. He says, stir up, rekindle the gift of God that is in you. And then he says this, for God, everybody say the word God out loud, God. For God has not given us a spirit of what? 
of fear. Do you know it's interesting, there's 138,000 words in the New Testament. That's the only time we have that Greek word, delia. It's cowardice. When you and I are being cowards, when we are being afraid, I don't care if those of you who are in athletics, those of you who are academic All-Americans, scholars, or some of you are just trying to stay on, when you have a spirit of fear, that does not come from God. God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. But he has given us, look on the verse, and this is a verse you ought to memorize the next time you're afraid. You go out for your athletic event. You're showing up for an exam. You're worried. You're going home for the weekend. Sometimes just going home for the weekend can give us a huge amount of stress because we come from dysfunction. 2 Timothy 1.7, God, you have not given me a spirit of fear. You have given me a spirit of what? Say it out loud. Love, power, and of a sound mind. Can I just give you a parenthetical note? I said I was reading from my favorite New Testament translation. This is the J.B. Phillips version. The bombs were dropping during the, London, during the Nazi Blitz of London. Nearly 100,000 people lost their lives. And kids were going to youth group. I mean, these were real people. And 60 years later, 60 years ago, J.B. Phillips was a pastor nobody had heard of in England. And can you imagine, you're hearing, they, they used to have siren services. Uh, one of the pastors, Pastor Sangster, actually had a red light on his pulpit so that when the bombs started dropping, people knew they needed to go for cover. And do you know what? They still packed the churches, knowing that they could be dead in an instant with a bomb dropping. J.B. Phillips realized that nobody in his youth group was reading the Bible. It was this archaic King James language. No one can, this, thee, thou. He decides to translate the New Testament in modern English. Do you know what the rest of the story is on J.B. Phillips who translated, I love his rendering. God's not given us a spirit of, le- lo- of fear, but of love, power, and of a sound mind. Do you know what happened to Dr. Phillips? Dr. Phillips committed suicide in 1983. A Christian broke all the stereotypes. You mean, Jeremiah, I can be a Christian and I can complete suicide? Absolutely. A Christian can commit any sin that is known to man, but God always provides a way of escape, that spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. So stay with me. Keep your phone. Keep texting in. We're going to look at the... We're going to look at the um, results here in a few minutes. By the way, 1990, by an act of Congress, the first week of October was forever memorialized, and we're in the first week of October, in case you didn't know, was forever memorialized as Mental Health Awareness Week. So we are right now, this, this topic could not be perfect, the convocation could not be time more perfect, Salim. This is Mental Health Awareness Week. So we're going to blow through some stereotypes in the next few minutes. Uh, And by the way, where are my purple people at? Raise your hand if you have purple on. Where are you? Awesome, awesome. Rock out, purple out day. We're raising awareness for domestic violence. So awesome, awesome on you. And thank you all my students who Facebooked me like 2,000 times to let me know. I don't know what that is, but you know, I'm just kind of going with the flow. So my invisible disease. Now, I mentioned to you that I've received 4,000 questions from students all over America, Canada, and the United Kingdom. For every one question I get about the Bible, I receive three questions about suicide and mental health. I was sitting in a publisher's meeting the other day, and the word that came out of Jonathan's mouth was, wow, wow. People are always shocked to find out that the number one question I'm asked is not about the swoon theory of the resurrection or how old Methuselah was, but real world questions. How do I deal with my dad? He just killed himself. How do I deal with my family? And so when I saw that, and then thinking about the students that visited my office, I decided I wanted to do something. And so I'm going to tell you about a book that comes out in just a few minutes. So college, university is full of first-time experiences. And anytime we talk about mental illness and anytime we talk about suicide, it's important for us to be authentic. So could I have your permission to try to be like almost embarrassingly uh, transparent with you for a few minutes? Just nod your head at me if I have your permission. Some of you, oh, okay, all right, all right, I think I saw a few nods. Um, by the way, uh, first thing I remember, my first experience, you know, first time you had a job, first time perhaps if you had a child that was born, first day of school, it's hard to forget first experiences. I remember the first time in my undergraduate days being in school in Virginia, the first time, I mean, I completely 
ran out of money. Are any of you there right now? You have, you're out of money. Raise your hand. That's a, that was a first for me. Mom, this is your beloved son, Jeremiah. How are you doing today? I need money in my account immediately. That was a first time experience for me. Uh, where's my wife at? Love her. This is Audrey on the front row, second row. Those of you who've taken my class, you know that I love to talk about my wife. Why? Because I'm kind of head over heels in love with her. By the way, I'm scoring points my anniversary is in two days. <laughs> um, Audrey, wave at the crowd. She's awesome. I want to briefly share with you about my first time that I kissed Audrey. It was an epic failure. So if you'll permit me, I just want to share it with you. Now, when I, found, when I saw Audrey on the beach in Panama City Beach, Florida, I was immediately attracted to her big time. And I went up to her, and gentlemen, I asked her out. Now, this was back when men were men, and you actually had to have a conversation, and you know, you couldn't like text a chick and be like, hey, you want to talk or go out? Like, you actually had to go up and put it all out there. Audrey, will you go out with me? No. <laughs> and then I called her home answering machine and said, Audrey, will you go out with me? I left it on it. Remember home answering machines back in the day? That got a resounding no. Apparently, she had family in town. But gentlemen, perseverance pays off. Some of you guys in here, don't give up. We're celebrating 15 years on Friday. Right on? Good on me. So, being the over-communicator that I am, I mean, I was falling in love with Audrey. And I, I mean, I knew it was time to kiss her. We had been dating long enough, if you know what I mean. And I mean, I had prayed about it, all right? I mean, I knew God wanted me to kiss her, okay? You can pray about anything you want. So my friends, I was calling, oh, and by the way, Audrey is one of those godly Christian girls who like to do church dates. You know, the boring kind. <laughs> Again, I said I'm being transparent with you. She wanted to go to church every time the doors were open. So, you know, I went dutifully, uh, but I called her. I said, Audrey, I want to kiss you tonight. <laughs> Huge pause follows, followed by more silence. And then I heard the two-letter word, Okay. Now, I couldn't spell it real good back then. Again, I was an undergrad. I would take okay. So, again, the only problem was we were meeting at church that night. Oh, gosh. Sermon unusually long. Worship never end. It seems like Audrey is walking very briskly to the church parking lot. And I'm thinking, oh, God, how am I going to do this, God? Help me. Um, <laughs> you know, real spiritual experience for me. Again, I'm being, you know, we're all sinners saved by grace. So she gets in her car, rolls down her Saturn window to say goodbye, and guys, I went for it right through the window. The only problem was epic failure. I did not negotiate the, the size or lack thereof of her window and nailed my forehead on her windowsill. You know what? I went right back in for the kill and got it. <laughs> I want to tell you about another first experience in my life. I want to tell you about the first person I buried as a pastor. I'll never forget it. The senior pastor was out of town, and I got a call and said, Jeremiah, we want you to do a funeral. Kim has died. Kim? Well, I knew Kim because she was there every Saturday night, every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night. Kim had four daughters. Kim had been teaching in the local school system for 20 years. She had just been voted teacher of the year. W what happened? Kim has com committed suicide. The first funeral that I ever did as a pastor was a completed suicide. Can you imagine that? Those of you who think that you might want to go into ministry, guess what? You're going to marry and you're going to bury. And there are some things that seminary or cemetery, depending on which one you went to, there are certain things that they don't prepare you for. And for me, it was my first, I mean, what do you say? I'm in my early 20s. And this awesome Christian lady who has broken all the stereotypes went out in the woods. She was chronically depressed, saw no way out, and didn't come back. I want to tell you I learned some lessons that I want to share with you this morning because we're all going to have a first. You're going to have your first experience, and perhaps many of you have, if I were to guess, where you know there is someone in your life that is chronically depressed. And the absolute worst thing that you can do is ignore it. Hear me now. You might come from one of those families where, you know, you get in a fight and all the unpleasantries were just swept under the rug and you never discussed it. That's dysfunctional. So don't project that on this situation. The worst thing that you can do with someone that you know is depressed right now is ignore it. I'm going to teach you how to have that conversation. Now, suicide, it's reached epidemic levels. 
I have a chapter in my forthcoming book, Unanswered, called Elephant in the Room, because we actually have an epidemic right now of pastors who are committing suicide. I can't tell you how many pastors I know who have ended their life. So don't give me this myth that Christians cannot commit suicide. Globally, one person dies every 40 seconds from suicide. You need to know that. Guess what the most at-risk age is? Right here, age 15 to 24. You, you right now, you talk about first experiences. As a university undergrad and master's, you are shaping your life habits for the rest of your life. And I know that is a, a bunch of pressure on you. And so that's why I want to see what our results are. Twi Do you know, by the way, that we're far more dangerous to ourselves than we are to other people? Twice as many people kill themselves in the United States as kill one another. We're far more harmful to ourselves than anyone else. I can give you more statistics. Every 15 minutes, someone completes suicide. Every person, though, who takes their own life, for every person who, is, who completes suicide, I would never say successful with it, who completes suicide, 25 have failed. I'll never forget Todd Maston who failed to commit suicide and blew everything from his eyes down off his face. Looked like something right out of The Walking Dead. And my dad, who was a traveling evangelist, stood up, packed arena, 5,000 young people. And he, of course, Todd could no longer talk. They had to reconstruct his face. And he gave my dad a note. I'll never forget one of the most powerful experiences. Todd Maston couldn't read. Jerry reading the note. If you're thinking about suicide, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's all he said. There's always hope, friends. God has not given us a spirit of what? Say it out loud. Fear. He has given us a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So let's check out our, and by the way, transparently, my dad is a suicide survivor. For every one completed suicide, there are 25 unsuccessful attempts. Can we bring up the slide um, with the, some of the results that are coming in from our poll? What are you depressed about? Treatment of veterans at HVU this semester. What's, what's stressing you? Uh, can everyone read this? Try to squint. Again, I have supersonic vision. The thought of fail, falling into depression or anxiety, that is huge. You can text me right now, 22333, keyword for HBU. What is stressing you out right now? What are you depressed about? Let's read these. Diet, not having enough free time, school, writing papers, budgeting, panic attacks, anxiety. I hear you. Panic attacks are legit. Money, family, see all these coming in, wow. Grades, friends, deadlines, money, body image. Uh, in my book, I discuss Anna, my 22-year-old friend, who suffers with chronic eating disorder. She's a year out of it, and she's speaking up. She's so courageous. I share her story in my book. She's the one who coined the phrase, I had an invisible disease, but no one could see it. She goes, she goes to church every week. Her eating disorder was so bad, she, couldn't, she even felt bad taking communion at church. That chronic. And we just keep them going through. HB, I feel worthless. And, wow, I feel worthless and meaningless. Temptation for sexual sins, lack of motivation, porn, lust, laziness. Getting into med school. Keep failing. Let's just keep them rolling. Keep letting me know. I want to ask you a question right now. And everyone take your phones because I don't want you to look at the person next to you, okay? Because this is really personal. And I'm going to do it myself. Let me get off my text to Audrey here. 22333. Three, three, three. I have a question for you. If you've thought about suicide in the last year, I want you to text 911. I'm not tracking your phone numbers. I couldn't call you back if I wanted to, but just text 911. And don't look at the person next to you. I'm going to do it too. <laughs> so 911. I'm always amazed. I'm always amazed at the amount of response that comes in when I ask people, just text 911 if you thought about suicide sometime in the last year. I know at least two of our students have. So number one, and I need to hurry up, number one, 
Can we all commit to stop the silence about mental illness and suicide? Raise your hand if you'll commit with me to stop the silence. Raise it all over this room. I want to see it. Jeremiah, I'm going to stop the silence. I'm going to start talking about the elephant in the room. The number one problem in universities that I address all over North America is the silence when it comes to mental illness and suicide. My friend was speaking the other day, and he said, we need to stop whispering in our churches about mental illness. I mean, when I say mental illness, what comes in your mind? What kind of pictures and words are conjured? You know, we all get this thought of some, somebody going crazy on some psych ward in a gown, demon-possessed. That is an inaccurate depiction of mental illness and of someone who's struggling with an invisible disease. I want to throw some numbers at you right now, and these are backed up by Dr. Daniel Moorhead, a Christian psychiatrist in Austin, Texas. If you get my book, you can see where I cite cite all of these studies. Mental illness is so prevalent, one out of every four people in this room is struggling right now with a mental illness, one out of every four. That is 62 million Americans. Yes, we need to stop the silence. This, 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 This stat that I'm about to give you was not surprising at all. Our faculty need to hear this. Our staff need to hear this. Our students need to hear it. Dr. Daniel Moorhead is my citation. Christian psychiatrist, Austin, Texas. 48%, how many numbers did I just say? 48. 48% of the global population will have a personal experience with mental illness sometime during their life. So one out of every two of you and me in this room, we'll have an experience of mental illness. You need to know what to do when that happens. And again, the worst thing that we can do is ignore that it's happening. And I wish I could get into my verses. I mean, the Bible talks a lot about mental illness, and so guess what? I think we should too, don't you? Jesus is asked in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven by a teacher of the law, uh, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Do you remember Jesus' response in twenty-two thirty-seven? You shall love the Lord your God with all your what? With all your heart. I can't hear you. With all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Mind. Guess what's lost on a lot of people that love to quote that verse? Loving God with my mind. Do you know that you, you in here, you are so gifted You can ask my students, I don't care what I'm teaching, I will look at them, Old Testament, New Testament, leadership, whatever, say, I love you. There's a champion in every single heart in this room. God said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to make you suffer? No, plans to prosper you, make you successful. Jesus said we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind. Isaiah 26, 3, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Look at these results coming in. I need peace. I need assurance. I need to know what to do. Secondly, can we please stop the shame and exclusion? Again, I'm being very transparent with you, and I appreciate you giving me permission to do that. Uh, Again, I had the privilege to pastor before I went into scholarship at just a vibrant church, wonderful people. I miss them dearly. For 10 years, I had a meeting, though, that I'll never forget. I had a family come meet with me, and I actually call this a disaster in my book. And they said, Pastor Jeremy, I'm meeting with you today because we've been asked to leave our other church, and we would like your permission to join this church. I said, you don't need my permission to join this church. Well, we just wanted to tell you why we were asked to leave Uh, The last church we were at, the the pastor asked us to leave because our daughter has mental illness. What a disaster. I mean, really, Christians? Really? We're going to tell someone you can't worship with us? That is so screwed up. And so, you know, as a gospel scholar, what I can't assure you with my scholarship hat on, and Matthew, and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I don't ever see Jesus banishing someone, do you? I see Jesus doing what refuge worshipped about, breaking bondages, breaking chains. He never pushes someone aside. That's shaming them. And do you know we do that right here at HBU? Oh, that's the kid with mental problems. We don't want to shame you. We love you. We want to help you. I hope you'll help me when I'm having a mental break. And chances are I will at some point in my life if these statistics are true. We don't mean to but we shame people and we shouldn't. So number three, what do I want to leave you with? Number three, we need to understand mental illness 
and we need to be present. I want to say this very quickly. Many, many people don't actually know how to define mental illness. I've heard some of the most messed up definitions of mental illness. Mental illness, again, thanks to my psychiatrist friend, Daniel Moorhead, is defined as a physical dysfunction. Remember, I just said physical a physical dysfunction of the brain that causes you and I to act, an inability to act, think, or feel in a person's normal character. I mean, this is really stark. The World Health Organization recently said in 2012 that, that the leading depression, mental illness, it's the leading cause of disability worldwide. The number one cause of disability, not car accidents, not problems at work, depression the number one reason for disability. By the way, $193 million lost every year in, in your and my uh, annual earnings just from mental illness being such a distraction and such a problem. So we need to understand it. We need to be present. We need to show up for it. Fourthly and finally, we need to be part of the healing equation. Now everybody look right up here at me. I want to personalize this for you. You need to become sensitive in the person in your life, in my life, who is struggling with mental illness. You need to become sensitive to that. What do I mean? Well, let me put it this way. I was watching a TED Talk the other day. I love to watch TED Talks when I'm working out. And a young lady was up giving this, what's so funny about mental illness? It was a comical talk, and I didn't agree with all of her conclusions, but she said something so powerful I've never heard of before, and I totally agree, and I want to see if you agree with what was said. Why is it that diseases and injuries of every part of your body except the brain elicit compassion from our friends and loved ones? Okay, let me transport us to a church. You know, you're in a Bible study, perhaps right here, you're with RA, you know, you get sick, or somebody unfortunately gets a terrible diagnosis. Christians spring into action, let's do meals, pastor visits, never leave the person alone, take them to chemo. But if you have a problem with your brain, oh gosh, oh, 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 I don't even know if they should be here anymore. Why is it that the brain, a physical part of our body, does not elicit the same compassion that a broken leg would or a broken wrist? We need to stop that. So who in your life do you need to become sensitive to who's struggling with mental illness. The other point I want to tell you is mental illness is nobody's fault. Would you say that out loud with me? Nobody's fault. Parents are not to blame and patients are not to blame. Parents are not at fault and patients are not to blame. And some of you parents in here, you need to hear that. And guess what? There's no silver bullet. I interview Anna in my book, Unanswered. She still struggles. It is a daily battle, but she's, she said, it's amazing how free I got when I started talking to someone about my depression. The problem was no one would ever talk to her about it. Mental illness is not a spiritual problem, ladies and gentlemen. I cannot pray my mental illness away. Just as if I get up out of bed in the morning and I have a cholesterol problem, I need to go get on the elliptical. I need to stop eating brownies at night. I have a treatment plan. If I have a mental illness, there should be a treatment plan for that physical problem in my brain. That's what I want to encourage you with today. It's an often overlooked fact um, that many of the strongest Christians that have ever lived have struggled with mental illness. And I'm going to hasten to close now. Um, I want to bring up the other slide that we did right at the end. This is the key question. Now make sure you take notes for this next part. Remember, if I said if you didn't hear anything else in my message, I want you to hear this. Can we bring up uh, the other slide, please? I want to teach you what do you do? If you believe you have a friend, a family member, someone close to you, someone living in your dorm, someone in your class, one of your professors, if there is somebody at risk, I want you to ask the key question. And I want to make sure you're hearing this, so I'm going to ask you to to do what we do in my class, and we're going to read that question out loud together, okay? One, two, three. Do you have a, let's say it a little louder, that's weakness now, do you have a plan, method, or timeline? That is the key question. Do you have a plan, a method, or a timeline? And if someone has a plan, a method, or a timeline, either all three or not, or one or two, they are in immediate danger. Hear me. The worst thing that you can do is not ask the question. So ask the question. 
Have enough of the love of God and Jesus in your heart. Stop thinking about me and start thinking about the other person. I want to ask you in here right now. Can I ask you? Do you have a plan, method, or timeline right now to take your life? If you do, you need to talk to someone. We have an incredible spiritual life department here. We have people like Salim, full of the love of Jesus. People in our spiritual department, your RAs. We gather and we pray for you as professors. Talk to someone. There's always hope. There's always a way out. And then some of us, we don't feel very equipped to speak to someone, so you ask the key question, what's something practical you can do right now? Give this phone number right here. This phone number I endorse unequivocally. It is 1-800-273-8255. You know what's so cool? The National Suicide Prevention Hotline is partnered with Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook because it's amazing what people post on Facebook. I mean, aren't you kind of shocked sometimes in, in good and bad ways what people post on Facebook? They have actually know how to geographically pinpoint someone who is showing a suicidal ideation on Facebook and immediately reach out to that person based on their comments. So when someone says, I'm going to kill myself on their wall, immediately the suicide prevention line partners with Facebook to reach out to that person. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's a neat way that social media... So I want to encourage you, like. You probably can't read that on the bottom. Like this organization on Facebook. And while you're at it, we like Christian Thinkers Society too. Thank you so much. So that is the key question. I want you to leave here with that. Where are you right now in this message? I want to close with this because I have 120 seconds. When I lived in Oxford, England, and I was finishing my doctoral residency, my friend Mike said, Jeremiah, you have got to go one hour away to this place called Olney. Now, I had never heard of Olney, but it's a place that all of us should have heard of. Do you want to know why? It's an hour from Oxford. It's near the town of Milton Keys. Do you know who lived in Olney in the United Kingdom? A guy named John Newton. Now, you worship people in here. You probably have heard the name John Newton before. We should have all heard him because in 1773, on New Year's Day, he's sitting there. He's having his devotion. He gets some extra inspiration. I mean, don't you want to have devotions like this? And he decides to write down some lyrics. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now... You know, this, you know the song, right? It's the most famous song ever. He writes that down and only, and he goes and he gives it in a Bible study. Wouldn't you have loved to be in the Bible study when those lyrics were first read? It was a poem. What people don't know is that Newton had a co-author by the name of William Cooper. A famous poet, Benjamin Franklin, read all of his poems... William Cooper had been in an insane asylum for seven years before he ever met his new friend, John Newton. John Newton made a house visit on him because John Newton was the local rector, the pastor. And do you know what he did? He meets this guy, William. He's really a gifted poet. He's tried to kill himself numerous times. John Newton walks up and puts his arm around him and says, let's write hymns together. Now remember, hymns in those days, they took the pub tunes that were sung in the pubs And they gave them Christian lyrics. It's really fascinating. So, I mean, these songs were extremely relevant back in that day. They publish the only hymns, Amazing Grace is in that hymn, all the while with William Cooper struggling with mental illness. Some of the greatest Christians in this room right now are struggling with mental illness. That doesn't mean God can't use you. That doesn't mean God has put you on the shelf. We don't want to have a spirit of fear. Can we leave here agreeing that we're going to have a spirit of love of power, and of a sound mind. If you'll do that, I pray you will. I pray you'll reach out to the person in your life who's struggling. Uh, Let me give you this. I want to leave you with more information, so I want to make sure everyone gets this. As you leave today, friends of ours are going to hand this this little postcard out to you. This gives you information about a book I have called Unanswered. It's about all the unanswered things like today we've discussed that nobody talks about from the pulpit. You know, 70% of pastors refuse, by the way, a recent LifeWay study, 70% refuse to speak about suicide from the pulpit even though people want them to. So will you take this with you? I'd appreciate you showing this some love, my book on social media, because it's a ministry tool. I just want people to have it. I want it to save lives. You guys, this has been awesome today for me. Can I just thank you so much for listening so well? Can I thank you for not moving around and being a distraction? And can I thank you for your honesty with your responses? 
I love you all, appreciate you. It's an honor for me to be here at HBU every single day. And Salim, I hope you'll, I hope you'll consider having me back, Brad. I really, I really love this. Thanks, guys. Hey, let's give him a hand. Praise God. What a blessing to have someone real. And, and please, uh, those cards as you walk out, even if someone doesn't hand it to you, there's boxes. Please take one. It'll be a blessing. And instead of a long prayer, I want you to know that every one of you are loved, you're forgiven, and we're here for you. Please, Spiritual Life Office, RAs, counseling, go in peace. God bless you.